Chapter 33, in which Phileas Fogg does not have to repeat his orders to Passepartout twice. The dwellers in Savile Row would have been surprised the next day if they had been told that Phileas Fogg had returned home. His doors and windows were still closed, no appearance of change was visible. After leaving the station, Mr Fogg gave Passepartout instructions to purchase some provisions and quietly went to his domicile. He bore his misfortune with his habitual tranquillity. Ruined, and by the blundering of the detective. After having steadily traversed that long journey, overcome a hundred obstacles, braved many dangers, and still found time to do some good on his way, to fail near the goal by a sudden event which he could not have foreseen and against which he was unarmed. It was terrible. But a few pounds were left of the large sum he had carried with him. There only remained of his fortune the £20,000 deposited at Bearings, and this amount he owed to his friends of the Reform Club. So great had been the expense of his tour that even had he won, it would not have enriched him. And it is probable that he had not sought to enrich himself, being a man who rather laid wages for honour's sake than for the stake proposed. But this wager totally ruined him. Mr Fogg's course, however, was fully decided upon. He knew what remained for him to do. A room in the house in Savile Row was set apart for Aouda, who was overwhelmed with grief at her protector's misfortune. From the words which Mr Fogg dropped, she saw that he was meditating some serious project. Knowing that Englishmen governed by a fixed idea sometimes resort to the desperate expedient of suicide, Passepartout kept a narrow watch upon his master, though he carefully concealed the appearance of so doing. First of all, the worthy fellow had gone up to his room and had extinguished the gas burner, which had been burning for 80 days. He had found in the letterbox a bill from the gas company, and he thought it more than time to put a stop to this expense, which he had been doomed to bear. The night passed. Mr Fogg went to bed, but did he sleep? Aouda did not once close her eyes. Passepartout watched all night, like a faithful dog, at his master's door. Mr Fogg called him in the morning, and told him to get Aouda's breakfast, and a cup of tea, and a chop for himself. He desired Aouda to excuse him from breakfast and dinner, as his time would be absorbed all day in putting his affairs to rights. In the evening he would ask permission to have a few moments' conversation with the young lady. Passepartout, having received his orders, had nothing to do but obey them. He looked at his imperturbable master and could scarcely bring his mind to leave him. His heart was full, and his conscience tortured by remorse, for he accused himself more bitterly than ever of being the cause of the irretrievable disaster. Yes, if he had warned Mr Fogg and had betrayed Fix's projects to him, his master would certainly not have given the detective passage to Liverpool, and then Passepartout could hold in no longer. My master, Mr Fogg, he cried. Why do you not curse me? It was my fault that... I blame no one returned Phileas Fogg with perfect calmness. Go! Passepartout left the room and went to find Aouda, to whom he delivered his master's message. Madam, he added, I can do nothing myself, nothing. I have no influence over my master, but you perhaps... What influence could I have? replied Aouda. Mr Fogg is influenced by no one. Has he ever understood that my gratitude to him is overflowing? Has he ever read my heart? My friend, he must not be left alone an instant. You say he is going to speak with me this evening? Yes, madam, probably to arrange for your protection and comfort in England. We shall see, replied Aouda, becoming suddenly pensive. Throughout this day, Sunday, the house in Savile Row was as if uninhabited, and Phileas Fogg, for the first time since he had lived in that house, did not set out for his club when Westminster clock struck half past eleven. Why should he present himself at the reform? His friends no longer expected him there, as Phileas Fogg had not appeared in the saloon on the evening before, Saturday the 21st of December, at a quarter before nine. He had lost his wager. It was not even necessary that he should go to his bankers for the £20,000, for his antagonists already had his cheque in their hands, and they had only to fill it out and send it to the bearings to have the amount transferred to their credit. Mr Fogg, therefore, had no reason for going out, and so he remained at home. He shut himself up in his room and busied himself putting his affairs in order. Passepartout continually ascended and descended the stairs. The hours were long for him. 
He listened at his master's door and looked through the keyhole, as if he had a perfect right so to do, and as if he feared that something terrible might happen at any moment. Sometimes he thought of Fix, but no longer in anger. Fix, like all the world, had been mistaken in Phileas Fogg, and had only done his duty in tracking and arresting him, while he, Passepartout, this thought haunted him, and he never ceased cursing his miserable folly. Finding himself too wretched to remain alone, he knocked at Aouda's door, went into her room, seated himself, without speaking, in a corner, and looked ruefully at the young woman. Aouda was still pensive. About half-past seven in the evening, Mr Fogg sent to know if Aouda would receive him, and in a few moments he found himself alone with her. Phileas Fogg took a chair and sat down near the fireplace, opposite Aouda. No emotion was visible on his face. Fogg returned was exactly the Fogg who had gone away. There was the same calm, the same impassibility. He sat several minutes without speaking. Then, bending his eyes on Aouda, Madam, said he, will you pardon me for bringing you to England? I, Mr. Fogg, replied Aouda, checking the pulsations of her heart. Please let me finish, returned Mr. Fogg. When I decided to bring you far away from the country which was so unsafe for you, I was rich and counted on putting a portion of my fortune at your disposal. Then your existence would have been free and happy. But now I am ruined. I know it, Mr. Fogg, replied Aouda. And I ask you in my turn, will you forgive me for having followed you and, who knows, for having perhaps delayed you and thus contributed to your ruin? Madam, you could not remain in India, and your safety could only be assured by bringing you to such a distance that your persecutors could not take you. So, Mr. Fogg, resumed Aouda, not content with rescuing me from a terrible death, you thought yourself bound to secure my comfort in a foreign land? Yes, madam, but circumstances have been against me. Still, I beg to place the little I have left at your service. But what will become of you, Mr. Fogg? As for me, madam, replied the gentleman coldly, I have need of nothing. But how do you look upon the fate, sir, which awaits you? As I am in the habit of doing. At least, said Aouda, one should not overtake a man like you. Your friends... I have no friends, madam. Your relatives... I have no longer any relatives. I pity you then, Mr. Fogg, for solitude is a sad thing, with no heart to which to confide your griefs. They say, though, that misery itself, shared by two sympathetic souls, may be borne with patience. They say so, madam. Mr. Fogg, said Aouda, rising and seizing his hand. Do you wish at once a kinswoman and friend? Will you have me for your wife? Mr. Fogg, at this, rose in his turn. There was an unwanted light in his eyes and a slight trembling of his lips. Aouda looked into his face. The sincerity, rectitude, firmness and sweetness of this soft glance of a noble woman who could dare all to save him to whom she owed all, at first astonished, then penetrated him. He shut his eyes for an instant as if to avoid her look. When he opened them again, Yes, by all that is holiest, I love you and I'm entirely yours. I love you. He said simply, Ah! cried Aouda, pressing his hand to her heart. Passepartout was summoned and appeared immediately. Mr. Fogg still held Aouda's hand in his own. Passepartout understood, and his big, round face became as radiant as the tropical sun at its zenith. Mr. Fogg asked him if it was not too late to notify the Reverend Samuel Wilson of Marylebone Parish that evening. Passepartout smiled his most genial smile and said, Never too late. It was five minutes past eight. Will it be for tomorrow, Monday? For tomorrow, Monday, said Mr. Fogg, turning to Aouda. Yes, for tomorrow, Monday, she replied. Passepartout hurried off as fast as his legs could carry him. Poof, that concludes chapter 33. The Project Gutenberg ebook of Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you'll have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. Title: Around the World in 80 Days. 
Author, Jules Verne. Release, date, January 1st, 1994. Ebook number 103. Most recently updated, August 6th, 2021. Language English. I kindly remind you, only two chapters remain. That said, we are now paused for season two. Here's your preview. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly, after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree, yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. You just experienced in the beginning. If you want the full experience, then you should subscribe. 
Moja Drama has been made for Spotify, created for all, with captions and video. Listen worldwide on iHeart, Pandora, Amazon Music and Apple Music. Until next chapter, stream on.